favorite I have. I wish that it was just at a different time. A most turbulent period of my life. Why would I put that on you? That's just like a very heavy thing to have to talk about. But because of that period of time, even though it was so much fun, I didn't get to go on and make new memories with him. There was just memories in a big storm. You said time was supposed to heal Promised me that I'd be better if you disappeared Time's running out, I get it now, my tears You didn't have the time, so you left me here I guess that you're a liar Cause you told me I'd survive, yeah it's like everything reminds me of you So let me ask you this If you ever find peace Would you leave just the way you did with me? Are you still making wounds? Giving scars Still living off the hopeless Living off the broken hearts Living off the broken hearts Gone by the time you said goodbye Unsteady love make it hard to find the line I should have known, felt all the cold, my dear Cause as soon as you left, time simply disappeared So I guess that you're a liar Cause you told me I'd survive, yeah it's like everything reminds me of you So let me ask you this If you ever find peace Would you leave just the way you did with me? Are you still making wounds? Giving scars? Still living off the hopeless Living off the broken hearts Living off the broken hearts I miss the touch of morning sun, making silhouettes of us way back when we had our paradise. But staying out all through the night, smoking, drinking, getting high. I was wrong and I have apologized. Where did you go? What can I do? I'm working on my problem, but I need you here to solve them. Where did you go? What should I say? I know that I can't make a change Cause there's something about you Keeping me sober Ladies and gentlemen, could we please ask you to take your seats as the next stand session is about to begin. Thank you.
Jesus is coming back. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'll bet you've got a few already. Okay, yeah, should we start? <laughs> Can you gather round? Well, I don't normally have that effect on people, but there we are. Um, we're still waiting for Eamon Boylan, who told me uh, about seven minutes ago he was two minutes away, so perhaps he's been way late. Uh, I'm Mike Emmerich. I am a director at Metro Dynamics, and we're here to talk about levelling leveling up, and specifically uh, whether levelling up is a zero-sum game, whether or not um, one place has to lose if another one gains, um, and what that means in practice. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Emmerich, director at Metro Dynamics. We're a place advisory. We work with uh, places, companies, investors all over the country, in the UK and elsewhere. And uh, we do a lot of work on levelling up. And uh, we are going to be joined by Eamon Boylan, who's going to talk specifically about the Greater Manchester deal or what he can say about the Greater Manchester deal in the context of levelling up. Uh, but before we go there, uh, we're, going to, we're going to go to uh, Pat Ritchie, who is sat to my far right, who is the chair of the Government Property Agency, a board member of Homes England, uh, the chair of my company, so I better do well, um, um, and as well as having been the chief executive of uh, Newcastle City Council and the Homes and Communities Agency. Uh, but we're going to kick off hearing from uh, another former uh, colleague, because um, uh, I used to work with Eamon, but Tim Newins, who used to be the chief executive of Midas, late of this parish, um, and now is um, the uh, managing director for levelling up at the Office for Investment in DIT. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, each of them questions, and I'm going to go pretty, pretty in a pretty focused way to Tim, who is going to speak as candidly as he can on the subject of what levelling up actually means. We have this commitment in the UK, I think most of you here are British, to level up the very disparate levels, levels of economic performance across the country. Um, there are plenty etymologists who would say that, that as a term, this is, this is, it doesn't make any sense. I think we all kind of know what it means. But what does the government think it means by levelling up in a context of regeneration? I think, uh, thanks Mike, and um, I think for me there is, um, there's a, there's a few tra trains of thought here, really, and obviously the white paper sets out the government's general view, which uh, has a family of policy areas which are, are there essentially to support the agenda. So devolution is one of the big ones, obviously you mentioned already, and Eamon will talk about a bit more. But also uh, the, the other selection is sort of free ports, the innovation accelerators that was named as part of the white paper. Um, we may hear a little bit more this week about investment zones as well, uh, which was announced last August, by, or last autumn, sorry, by the Chancellor. And also the Places for Growth agenda, which is uh, about obviously sending uh, or moving 30,000 roles within the civil service outside London as well. So I think overall there is that plan, there's the white paper, there are those policy areas. Um, I think within individual government departments, though, in terms of what does it actually mean for those individual government departments, that's maybe where it becomes a little bit trickier, really, and, and they have to interpret that for themselves and for their own for their own agendas. But what I would say is that it is still one of the three core strategic areas for each of the departments. So in our department, for example, the Department for Business and Trade, along with levelling up, you've also got science superpower and, uh, and also the net zero agenda as well. So it is absolutely one of the three principles that we look at. Um, but that definition of what it means, for me, it's about obviously raising productivity right across the country and particularly in places whose productivity is at least below the national average, and ideally looking to raise that to its, their peer average, and not just peer average in the UK, but peer average uh, internationally as well. Um, but I think in different departments, you could possibly ask whether the priorities that they're setting within levelling up actually are reflective of, of those needs specifically. So I think if you look at um, our department, I think on the investment side, some of those measures um, were trying to quickly reflect the white paper and hadn't really caught up yet. So they were slightly crude. It's more about the percentage of projects that land outside London and the South East, for example, which is obviously not necessarily addressing, addressing the core need. So I think what I've tried to do 
is, is look at the core needs. We're looking at some more research to back that up in terms of what type of investment, what type of investors as well are needed to really drive agglomeration, to drive the multiplier effect that, that really that investment can have. And we know that capital intensive investment drives a higher multiplier effect than non-capital. So we can't just look at this in terms of jobs. We need to look at it in terms of capital. And for that, we need to have a really clear plan around how we attract that capital and how we look at centering and really focusing that capital in different areas and around the strengths they have. Um, so that's what I've tried to do, really, is bring that, um, bring that a little bit more clarity uh, to that agenda and, and really help colleagues to, to understand what the key drivers are behind that. I think also what we're trying to do is, is build a closer relationship between central government and places. Um, so I think that relationship can sometimes be a little bit transactional. We need to make sure that's more partnership orientated. I think devolution deals are obviously the centerpiece of some of that partnership and we need to make sure that's inherent. I've certainly been working on the two trailblazer Devo deals between the West Midlands and Greater Manchester and government recently on the trade and investment agenda specifically. And again, that is all about bringing those places into the government thinking, into the government machine, if you like, and being part of that policy development, but just, just that communication in terms of what the market's doing, how we should react collectively to that, not just what central government's view is of that in terms of a reaction. Um, but I think th the things that excite me about it as well are that notwithstanding, and I know I've read your sort of really interesting piece, thought piece around levelling up and the good and the bad, um, but I think some of the bits that sort of fill me with confidence about the change that we can still have is that there are industries out there that are still very new. And so any, if you like, underinvestment or lack of investment historically can be offset by industries that have not yet to be realised and therefore are at the start of their journey, investment journey for that matter. Therefore, if you look at um, offshore wind, floating offshore wind, we can talk about the procurement strategy and that we've not necessarily realised the full benefit of UK content in standard offshore wind, but then floating offshore wind, which has the potential to at least equal, if not surpass, what we've seen in that industry for the UK, that's still a fledgling industry. And as long as we collectively get behind those, those new areas of opportunity, we set out what our ambitions are, what our poli you know, what policy and strategy is, and we have collective focus around those, I still think there's tremendous opportunity around those industries of the future, which can then drive that levelling up agenda. So, um, you know, whereas we accept there might not have been the focus uh, in exactly those areas before, I think we're gradually, you know, through a family of policy areas and through, you know, our focus and research and evidence base around which industries can drive that multiplier effect and change, then we can still make a considerable difference. Great stuff. Um, Thanks, Tim. I'm, I'm going to give Eamon another minute to catch his breath. I'm, I'm going to come to Pat in a second on the question of whether, whether le levelling up is, really is a zero-sum game. And I remember you know, many years ago, I was, I was a Treasury official. And bluntly speaking, I think the view of, 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 of the established economic view is still probably the, that most of what we do in regeneration is displacement. I think that's a lot of, a lot of orthodox economics in her, His Majesty's Treasury assumes that if you move stuff around the country, you end up, you end up uh, making the place, it would have gone poorer without making the, uh, the place it's going to richer. And um, I'm going to turn to you, Pat, and ask you whether or not that's borne out by your experience, because you've, uh, you've run a, de a development agency in, in the northeast um, uh, and then done some amazing regeneration uh, and other things in Newcastle, not least your work with LNG. I mean, do, do you recognise... I, mean, I don't recognise that picture in what Tim said, but I, I, don't, I don't think what Tim said is necessarily the stock of what those other Whitehall government departments are thinking. Is, does that sound right to you, Pat? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it has to be a zero-sum game. I think that um, it partly depends on whether levelling up sits within a, a broader economic strategy, because really levelling up is about dealing with regional and community disparities, and... You know, there's something about then how does that sit within the, the national strategy for innovation skills and then how is that delivered in a devolved way through the, 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 the sort of devolved structures that we've now created. And so I, I, I think that if levelling up is comprehensive 
and if it's um, linked to places and strengths, and if government then seriously engages with those places to help them grow, then you know that doing that at a regional level just makes more sense than trying to drive the economy from a national level because you can integrate with skills, transport, and all those other things that I'm sure Eamon will talk about in a bit. But it seems to me that that you know it partly depends on how that's seen as a as a kind of national effort and how comprehensive leveling up is and you know we, we've had various attempts at it but the the kind of approach to devolution and and looking at that across the whole of England in a more structured way seems to me to be a a, a move forward in how we're starting to look at um, leveling up across England I do think however that that you know one of the big things in all of that is how do you go beyond strategies and think about delivery and where does the capacity sit, both in national and in local government, to deliver on that? So there's a big piece for me about taking strategies and actually delivering on the ground and doing that in a kind of holistic way and thinking about levelling up, being about the economy, the place, but really importantly, people. Thinking about levelling up from the point of view of, of people and their ambitions and their skills. And if you don't really take that along and take people along with it, it's got to feel real to people and make a difference to their lives. And then you get much more buy-in. And lastly, levelling up can't be just done by the, pr the public sector. You touched on this, Tim. Um, levelling up has to be about the private sector investing in regions and investing in places in a way that plays to strengths but spreads capital across the whole of the UK and looking at future um, kind of capital investment in things like sustainability and other, other things. Great stuff. That, thank you, Pat. Eamon, you, um, you are stewarding the first of the devolution deals that were ever done and are sitting on the cusp of the latest uh, devolution deals yet to be done. Um, what in, what, what's your experience of levelling up in practice? You know, GMs have more money and more latitude than anywhere else to play with outside of, of London. Um, do, do you think there's evidence in what, what, what you know, various of us have spent the last 20 years doing that, that levelling up can happen in a way that is genuinely additive? And do you, see, do you see the announcements that are coming tomorrow in any way materially changing that? Firstly, can I apologise for forgetting that I'd left my TARDIS at home, so I do apologise for, <laughs> for being late to the, to the event. Um, if I can start by saying, I think the term, uh, this makes me unpopular with government, I think the term levelling up isn't really that helpful, to be perfectly honest. Levelling up sounds like a zero-sum game. And, and I don't think we can afford for it to be that. Fundamentally, for me, the agenda is about how do we drive productivity? And that's not a zero-sum game, that's a positive-sum game. But how do we drive it in places and in, uh, for people who've previously been left out of a product, productive economy? And that's fundamentally the challenge that faces us as local authorities across the country, but particularly, I think, in the north. Uh, if I was from the east of London, they might say it's not just a northern problem, quite clearly. So I think we need to really be very, very clear that fundamentally this is not about moving bits of cash around, moving civil servants around. Important those, those things, though those things are, it's about how we find an investment strategy that genuinely drives growth in productivity in places where it's not happened before. And we can look to an example of where that has been done. You can look to Germany, post-unification. Uh, it's cost a fortune, it's been, but it's been completely all-party focused. It's been completely consistently delivered over a period of 20-odd years. And the investment that's gone into East Germany to level it up, if you to use the phrase, has been quite consciously crafted and, and shaped to, to deliver growth in productivity. So one of the things that the German government has done <coughs> is, con is consciously located and created academic institutions and research institutions in the East in order to help them drive a, a research and, and development-led recovery in, in the economy of that part of the world. And I think that's the kind of approach that we need. Now, am I just going to sit here and say the government therefore needs to commit 220 billion euro or whatever it is that the Germans have spent on that? No, I'm not. But I think that's the approach that we need. And the problem that I've got with some of the levelling up agenda, I, and I welcome it, I absolutely welcome the aspiration. I think it's fantastic that a government has the aspiration to do what it's trying to do. I support that 100%. 
But some of what we've seen through the levelling up funding decisions so far strike me as there being a bit of ambivalence in government between whether levelling up is actually about driving productivity in lower performing regions and transforming the economy in those regions, or whether it's about finding ways of ameliorating and mitigating deprivation where you find it. And I think if you look at the decisions in the levelling up funding that's been made so far, it's a bit more of the latter than it is of the former. And I think for us, it's got, we've got to maintain the argument that actually there is a net gain to the UK PLC of driving growth in those lower performing regions. Um, and th there is capacity in those lower performing regions to, to uh, uh, absorb and, and deliver that, that growth. Some of that is not about capital investment. Some of that, and I keep going back to this like a, a broken record player, is about the way in which we invest in equipping our people to be able to compete in a, in a, in a changing and modernizing economy. And that's fundamentally why skills is at the heart of the devolution deal that I'm not allowed to talk about until tomorrow, but everyone knows about already. Um, so it's, um, it, 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 I, well, I do genuinely welcome the government's commitment, absolutely welcome it, but I do think we need to work with them to help shape it to make certain that it's actually delivering on the aspiration that's set out behind it. Great stuff. Thanks, Eamon. I mean, one of the things, I picked up on something you said then, Tim, which is that um, um, capital investment drives a higher multiplier return. I mean, we know it drives a high multiplier return because there's endless studies that show it does. I would contend that if we look at the framework the British government set out in its levelling up white paper, whatever it was, 18 months ago, which for the first time talked about a six capitals approach in which we talk about financial capital, physical capital, human capital, as Eamon's talked about, institutional capital, the stock of institutions and businesses in cities and regions, social capital, environmental capital. We've not actually really looked at investments per se. I mean, we, we spend cash on various of these things, but we don't look at them in quite the same way we do just normal physical capital. And the truth is, for a lot of the interventions that Eamon's just talked about, or that Pat has, has, has done as Chief Executive of Newcastle. We don't actually know whether or not they work because we've never tried them. There's what we call the absence of a counterfactual. So that it seems to me to be evidence as to why we should have more devolution to, to, to experiment with these things. But let's, let's turn this conversation then, because I think what I'm hearing is levelling up, stupid ter term though it may be, could be a good thing because it's about trying to get uh, productivity up in places where it's low. The question is how do, how do we actually do that? So to, a second round of questions to you guys then. So Tim, you talked you know, eloquently and passionately about, about uh, new forms of offshore wind. I mean, that looks like it's been one of the success stories already, and from what you were saying, could be one of the success stories in the future. I don't think that's kind of what people feel around the north at the moment. I think it's, 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 it's been driven by relatively few companies with relatively little of the, of the, of the jobs and, and the benefits from that coming through to the north. Could you... Sort of elaborate a little bit, and then I'm because I noticed he was shaking his head, and I'm going to I'm going to turn to Eamon before coming to Pat. Um, I, I think you're right in terms of the, the full benefit of the huge offshore wind farms that we have hasn't been felt in terms of some of the supply chains. There, there has been significant investment in across the country, actually, particularly in the northeast, around some of this, and obviously in Humberside with Siemens and the factory there. Um, but I think what what we can clearly see is that there's so much more opportunity there. Um, what, what prevents us sometimes is a, is a broader policy area. So, obviously, in terms of something like offshore wind, it's the, the CFD agreements and it's, you know, those broader sort of energy agreements between government and companies that will actually drive some of the contracting, which then also, uh, through the procurement exercise, I think UK government has definitely realised about the possibility of driving domestic growth and domestic productivity through that procurement air, um, exercise. Certainly we've seen that from the MOD over the last 12, 24 months, where they have definitely twigged how that can actually drive it. So, and in, I think, in what way and what have, what have they done differently? So it, it's, it's essentially looking at the weighting of those contracts and how you can actually build in, um, if you like, the social value within contracts, not necessarily going for the cheapest all the time, but actually taking a broader view on procurement and about resilience as well and you know that's I think possibly that's why MOD have seen that before anyone yeah. is because resilience is such a key factor for them that that does have a really strong weighting in the decisions that they make around procurement so but but I think <clears throat> I think that gives confidence then to other departments in their procurement exercises to do similar and to see that resilience benefit in actually driving UK content production through procurement exercises so 
But I think if you if you go up to places and, and Ramon is in the, the audience here, you know, her and I were in in the northeast a few weeks ago. If you talk to the sort of offshore wind catapult up there, I mean, they know exactly how to take full advantage of this opportunity, and it's about how we actually take that through. You know, as I say, the levers of government, which is partly procurement, partly about how we actually incentivise some of those things as well, which is not a straightforward thing, but um, how we actually look at what critical mass we need to create in the UK to essentially create a global exporting industry that is based here, not a procurement exercise which is importing essentially that technology and those skills. And that, that's the key dilemma. Now that is something absolutely that government are working on and we work closely with our colleagues they're now actually part of our department, some of them, um, but also the new Department for Energy, Security and, and uh, Net Zero, also the Department for, for Science, uh, Innovation and Technology as well. We are working collectively to try and look at those areas and how we, how we work across procurement, about, across regulation and then across investment support to actually generate those opportunities in much more quantum than we have done over the last few years, potentially. Great stuff. Th thanks, Tim. Eamon, are you, are you, you weren't quite as at one on my description of the, um, uh, uh, the offshore industry. Is this with the, the principle or the execution? N not the principle at all. I mean, I think it's absolutely right the government should focus on those industries that will drive our future. And s clearly sustainable energy is one, and sustainable energy is an area where the North has got the capacity to compete on a global level. Where I shook my head was you said it's part of the success story today. It isn't. Okay. What we have is a very, very good offshore wind assembly process industry. We don't have a manufacturing industry. We don't have an innovation industry built around it. We're importing all of that. Now, that might be good enough to get us to certain places, but it's not good enough to drive the future that Tim was describing. I think we just need to be very clear about that. I'm not decrying what's been done, because some of what's been done, particularly on the East Coast in, in England, and it's gone, is brilliant. But it's not at scale, and it's not the, the, the volume, and it's not the consistency that we need. And I think if you want an illustration of the fact that we need a, a concentrated industrial strategy focused on industries of the future, look at Britvolt. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't again, <laughs> say more. I don't need to say more, really. I mean, fundamentally, British Volt, e electrification is absolutely part of the future. Where are we with a national or even a regionally, regional strategy around electrification of infrastructure? We are nowhere. And that's something that, well, Tim's absolutely right, and I applaud the government for doing what they're doing in terms of those industries, but we need to up our game, and we need to have more confidence in our ability to innovate and exploit that innovation. It is true that the British, the old myth, were great at innovation and were lousy at exploitation of innovation, that's and that's what we're, we're, you know, we're trying to turn around through the industrial strategy we published in Greater Manchester. And I know that I mean, Pat did exactly the same in the North East, but I think we, we, we shouldn't delude ourselves that we are where we're not. I, I think that's an entirely fair counter to what I said. And for what it's worth, um, you mentioned um, Germany earlier on. On a rough calculation, I reckon they spent about a thousand times more on reunification than we've spent so far uh, on levelling up. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a quantum of resource issue that at some point matters. And you, but we've got to do what we can with the resources that are there to show that there are better ways of doing policy. I don't cite Germany as a means of beating us up. Germany was driven by a number of requirements, demands of, of reunification that you know, are, are different to where we are now. But the results they've achieved through the investment strategy that they've put in has been spectacular in comparison to, to, where, to where we are. And some of it's about money, and some of it's about consistency. There have been two major revisions to the vocational skills industry in Germany since the Second World War. Yeah. We had two last week, and probably three the week before. Uh, and that we just need to try and make certain that we are being consistent in our application and, cons and long-term in our thinking about the way in which we, we deploy I, I, however much resources. I, I, ne I, there will never be enough money. I, to I totally agree with that, which is one of the reasons why, as a company, we, we just did a think piece like late last year. It's on our website. It's called Time to Get Serious, which is trying to make exactly that point. We've been playing around at this, occasionally making breakthroughs, but not systematically uh, making the, the changes that we're going to need to. Pat, you, when you were at Newcastle, I'd say you lived through what was probably as close an experiment as I've seen um, uh, to, to what Eamon was talking about. You know, what you did with Legal in General on the former Newcastle Brewery site was exactly trying to kickstart um, that process of doing something that, that is both 
innovation and, and industrial in a city centre. Can you say just a word or two about what you did with LNG for anyone who doesn't know about it? And what's your sort of interim assessment of whether or not, what, what the lessons are for levelling up that you would learn from that experience? Um, well, first of all, I would say that um, for those that don't know the site, it's former Newcastle Brewery site, um, bought by the Regional Development Agency, the Council and the University quite a long time ago. This sort of illustrates Eamon's point to some extent. Um, RDAs were abolished and the, um, the, the Council and the um, University bought out the site. It's probably had various types of public investment in it. It's had brownfield land money and various other things. But what was made it successful, really, was the long-term vision of the partners and the fact that the leadership of the process, despite the fact that we were maybe in different roles, remained the same and people kind of, you know, getting behind it and that kind of long-term vision. The big game-changer for it and a number of sites in... Uh, in Newcastle was the city deal, which was done under Greg Clark, I think, where um, we got a sort of version of a tax increment finance zone on that site and a number of others. And that allowed the council to sort of take a risk in terms of borrowing and being able to then get a retention of um, the income from that site and business rates. And, and now there is a kind of fund building up that will be reinvestable into other into other sites across, uh, across the city. Um, the, the Pilgrim Street site was also part of the same thing. That's where sort of seven to 9,000 jobs, uh, civil servant jobs are gonna be in the city centre. And it, it was a kind of combination of leadership, long-term vision, but also um, flexible and a kind of innovative finance model that allowed us then to bring in legal in general and the biggest single deal that the, the council had ever done that had been done in the city as a partner on a, on a district which is really about the university driving innovation across the city. So it's uh, the university uh, computing school, the, um, there are two national institutes of uh, innovation, one on aging and one on digital on that site. There's lab buildings, there's sort of start-up buildings, and then there's bigger offices and there's new housing going in. And, uh, and basically, it's, I think it's a bit of a model for the sort of thing that you can do on innovation within, uh, within cities. And I think increasingly, given the changes we're seeing in city centres, the the, the role of universities, the role of creating kind of innovation, innovative places that have talent and people in spaces that kind of make a difference to the place is a, is a really important thing for us moving forward. I mean, I, I think the point, the point that Eamon made about consistency is the fundamental one, and I'm an optimist. I wouldn't have done, been involved in three devolution deals in the North East if I hadn't been, but I am optimistic. And I think that the current kind of creation of bigger, more powerful combined authorities across England is really, really important in terms of not sort of chopping and changing. The reason, part of the reason that, that you know, Germany has been able to achieve what it's done is partly investment and national commitment, but it's also the structures don't change all the time and you've actually got capacity built at those levels to do strategic planning and delivery. So it, it seems to me sticking with what we've got and really building around the, the devolved combined authorities and, and linking that to um, almost creating a a, a, a top-down and bottom-up strategy for the country has, has got to be the way that we, we, we need to work in the future. But doing that in collaboration with the private sector, because they need that long-term certainty, you know, and, and ability to be able to work alongside a, a long-term vision from the, the public sector that's been built with them. Can I ask you to... I'm not sure Tim's going to want to answer this one, but just before I ask if anyone's got questions, does... Does local taxation have a, a bigger role to play in here, the ability to, uh, to, to retain more of the benefits of growth? Because I know it's one of the things that's been talked about in the trailblazer devolution deals. Could it in principle play a role, Eamon, or is that not where we should be going? There's been a lot said about um, fiscal devolution. I think we just need to be realistic about what it actually can deliver. Mm -hmm. Because much of the thing, many of the things that we've been talking about as part of a fiscal uh, solution provide 
money at the margin. Uh, it's not. We need a fundamental restructure of the taxation system in the UK, to be honest, if we're going to go to a, a serious local, uh, uh, locally devolved decision making around the deployment of taxation. I think that's just something that we've never really grappled with. Now, you know, I am not going to sit here and, and live in hope, because I'm, I'm not going to live that much longer, but for as long as I do live, that we're going to go to a federal structure and actually start to make decisions at a local level like they do in the United States or France or Germany. Um, but I do think we need to think very hard about how we restructure the way in which we deploy um, uh, uh, our taxation structures across the UK. It's not just about giving me the power to do a hotel tax or a workplace parking levy, because they'll raise a few bob, but that's really literally what, 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 they, what they will do. More important, and this is why the deal I'm not allowed to talk about, but I'm going to talk about anyway, uh, at the centre of it is a single settlement, uh, which main, means that I will have the ability, I, big me, <laughs> we will have the ability to manage our, a large part of our resources over a five-year period and, and deploy them flexibly, move them around like you would in your, in your businesses to meet the priorities that change on a daily basis. Unlike the 147 different funding streams I'm reliant upon at the moment, all of which come with their own set of rules, all of which come with their own expensive competitions uh, that, uh, that, that mean most of my staff spend most of their time competing for money and then filling in forms to say that they spent the money on exactly what they said they were going to spend it on in the first place. It's, a, it's not the most productive way of, uh, for, of fulfilling your career. So it's, it's, that, it's, it's that ability to manage over a longer period with more certainty that's actually more important than the quantum of money. Uh, and I make myself very unpopular with some of my colleagues when I say it's not about more money, it's about more flexibility, but I genuinely believe that's the case. Can I say I gave Pat a right load of stick when she was buying these bloody brewery sites going back a few years. <laughs> she was right, I was wrong. Very good, <laughs> very good. Pat, do you want to answer that? I could name a few others, actually, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. There's another brewery site, there was another brewery site that is also Vox, Vox yeah. Radio, yes. I was quite keen on brewery sites. But, um, I, I think one of the things, I, I mean, th what Eamon talks about, about the sort of flexibility is really important. And one of the things the RDAs did have was a single pot that made a difference in terms of where you could deploy resources. And a lot of the things, some of the stuff we talked about, actually, the, the uh, offshore wind stuff was set up by One North East. So there's kind of stuff that takes quite some time to, 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 to push through. What the RDAs, I don't think, did particularly well, and what I think we need to do more of at the kind of combined authority level is really think about the kind of people consequences of devolution and how you invest in productivity and skills. And I'm, look, we'll look with interest at whether that is part of the, the deal tomorrow. And if you look at the North East deal, there is a strong focus on um, health and productivity um, among the population, there's a strong focus on education and, and I think when you look at the sort of different deals across the country, each is sort of pushing the boundaries a bit around, you know, the, the levers that we'll get at a regional level and for me the biggies are around education and skills. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll come back to that. So what I, with 10 minutes to go, what I hear is, you know, there's no reason if we do devolution and policy properly why this idea of levelling up such as it is is a zero-sum game. There's every reason to believe that if we do the right things we can benefit the places that need it without hurting the places uh, that are already doing well. It's about long-term policy and, it's, uh, and, the, and I think what actually comes out of what you've all said in different ways is there's no revolution about to happen here and perhaps there should be in moving towards a more fit, uh, federal system but it ain't going to happen. What change happens at the margins, we need to keep doing the right thing at scale for a long time using the resources at our disposal and such, such other resources as we can uh, manage to get our, our hands on. So if change happens at the margins, I, I guess the question I have for you guys is, are there other schemes and things that you would want to do that are, that are not possible at the moment uh, because of the wretched rules, the, the funding rules or what have you? Are there things that you need that you want to throw at these guys as, they, as, we, as we all go away and think about the future of levelling up? Who's got, a, who's got a comment or a question about a scheme or a, a project they're working on that, that would benefit from the sorts of things we've been talking about? Because if not, I'm going to go straight back to where Pat was on skills. Has anyone got one? Okay, well, let's, in that case, let's go, let's go back to skills. So, are, are, actually, no, Eamon, are we, can you say a bit more about what we're, we might see on skills, if, hypothetically, there were to be a hypothetical announcement tomorrow? 
uh, hypothetically, um, we will see the ability of Greater Manchester to work collaboratively with government agencies on co-designing post-16 curriculum. Uh, we will see greater control over um, the adult education budget and beyond it into post-19 funding. We'll see a greater ability for us to work collaboratively with the further education sector in GM to design and deliver curriculum content that's geared towards uh, the emerging skills requirements of the, of the economy. So, potentially, there is a, a real op opportunity for us to, to change the game uh, in terms of uh, people's access, to particular to vocational training and skills. And do you have a sense? Do you have a sense of what proportion of the amount of money that goes through your average college that that you will therefore have some leverage over? Is that is that a large? It sounds like quite a large proportion of it. We will have influence over it. Yes, um, we currently have influence over the adult education budget. Pure and simple, uh, which is uh, relatively small. Which is relatively small. Uh, so we have influence over the broader curriculum, but I, I wouldn't want to put a, a monetary value or a percentage okay. on it. To be honest, um, Tim, one of the things that I think, um, I mean, a, a lot of the liberalisation of policy over the last thirty years was, you know, letting markets work uh, by having lots of contracting to make sure the lowest price bidder gets it. What we know is that the lowest price bidder is not always the person who's going to deliver the best value to, to a place. And in the era of social value, we've started to see that coming back from that. We've started to see uh, uh, um, uh, public authorities thinking ab about you know, those institutional social capital points that were in, in the government's framework. Could, couldn't should the government be doing more on the issues that Pat and Eamon have talked about to, to ensure, as we think about you know, um, yeah, the future of... Um, uh, uh, electricity generation, be it, be it offshore or, or, or through batteries, that, that we could do more to build, build on the human capital of the communities where those projects take place? And what's I stopping mean, us? <laughs> I mean, the answer is yes, obviously, in, in terms of we should be doing it. Um, I think, uh, I mean, if you, if you look from just a pure investment lens, um, what the two critical factors for investors generally are in a place, certainly in traditional corporate investment, it's, it's access to market and skills. So if you, can, if you can build a marketplace that is simplified in terms of regulation, uh, that is open, um, that obviously promotes that side of it. And then from a skills perspective, if you can have skills in a volume and a, a, a sort of a relevance, if you like, to those growing needs of industry, then again, there is with skills very much, I think, a build it and they will come mentality to that. If you can grow the right skills and the right quantum, um, we've certainly seen, I mean, we talked earlier about universities driving um, civic growth, if you like, and absolutely, they, they have been critical. I mean, obviously, I was in Manchester for sort of 15 years, and uh, the, the universities, the four universities, four key universities there, drove a huge proportion of that interest from investors in terms of the 30,000 graduates that were coming out of those universities every year, and key subjects, you know, huge proportion of those STEM subjects. I know, I went to Newcastle University, and that was a big part up there as well. And the Helix project, uh, again, is, is a great show that those skills have generated huge interest. And the computer science building, obviously, on Helix has driven the digital industries to that site directly, hasn't it? Um, and we, you can see that wherever, you, you know, in Bristol, likewise, if you look at the engineering skills that are coming out of the universities there, again, they're going directly into the um, aviation industry, the aerospace industry there as well, and very R&D focused as well. So I think absolutely can skills deliver that growth? Fundamentally, yes. I mean, everything suggests it can. I think it will be really interesting through the devolution deal to see whether that additional control... I think, I think where government... you know, The reason why we need that absolutely close partnership between national and uh, regional local government is because... Government can have the big ideas at a macro level and try and understand the levers of government and how they work best. What it doesn't necessarily know how to do is deliver that in places directly. The, the, the places, you know, it's the places themselves that understand how to really deploy that on the ground and how to generate real, I think, real value in their own place and understand the mechanics and the dynamics of that. And therefore, that's why you need that fundamental partnership because you need national to understand which levers are most important from the local area, and then you need the local area to actually show how to deliver it. Great stuff. So I think that's, that's where I would sit. So in which case, time has nearly beaten us. Last quick word, Eamon, Pat, and then Tim. 
most of the people sitting here are from the private sector. If you had to give one message to help you in your, in your re respective day jobs in your, with your public sector hats on, what, what, what would it be? What more could the private sector do to help, help with this levelling up journey? And, and how, can, how, how can they best help? What's the one thing you could do? I mean, it's, it's a theme that we've come back to time and time again during the course of the week, or today, and, and we'll come back again during the course of the week. Um, and that's to think about, as part of your, 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 your business planning, as part of the, the way in which you're framing your business, think about the place that you're in. Uh, and that's something that I think we, we need to do, that local authorities need to do better to create that sense of place, that sense of shared purpose around a place to understand what the interdependencies and dynamics are that make places work better. Because having your business in a place that's working well makes it more attractive, makes it more sustainable, makes it more sustainable for your employees to live and work there. And I just think that's something that we really need to, to recognise that we, we lost for, for decades that, that sense of, of, of responsibility and location in places. I think it was there in industries in the past. It's, it, it, it's been lost for all sorts of reasons. It's been lost in the public sector as well. Uh, so that's, where, that's my, my one simple mantra. I've got about 37 others, but I'll come back to those later. It's a good start. <laughs> Pat? Um, I, I think similar. I think there's something about long-term collaboration and, and kind of um, s starting that early and being very clear about what the outcomes are for both partners. And I also think it's really important that both from a public and private um, partnership point of view that there's absolute, this might sound really boring, but I do think it's really important, that there's absolute clarity about governance and kind of what the deal is and what the governance of a deal is. And that's understood and time has been spent on that at the, the upfront. And then ongoing delivery and a commitment to kind of ongoing delivery. But I think it's, it's about that depth of collaboration and understanding what you do when it goes wrong. Because I think we've had experience in different places of some, some, some of that public-private partnership. What, what's the, the means of sorting it if it goes wrong or coming out of it? And, and I say that partly from you know, having to deal with um, we in deals that collapsed when the housing collapse came, as we each did, and, and kind of how you, how you kind of go back to that yeah. is, is really quite important. And spend some time on, on that up front and then focus on the delivery, because often there's a bit of celebration of the deal and then teams move on to other things. There's something about ongoing partnership and delivery. Tim, what, one quick sentence. It was going to be partnership for me as well, really. I think transparency, honesty, inquisitiveness, actually. There's so much available in places that actually, without that communication about what's driving business and investors, then places can't react to that. And sometimes, you know, the academic sector isn't always the best at showing exactly what is going on within its walls. Um, and certainly, you know, in my experience, we've, we've sort of surfaced a number of opportunities um, through that conversation, that honest and transparent conversation between private business at boardroom level, what their ambitions are, and between a strong university and what their capabilities are. And that has brought about opportunities that then, with the public sector partners, how, how do we make this happen? And that, that's the exciting bit for me, whether it's national or local public sector partners as well, how do we make this happen? And, you know, combined bringing a solution together. And certainly, you know, we've seen that work uh, over the years, but the more we can have those partnerships and develop that, that sort of inquisitiveness, that transparency, that communication that actually surfaces new and exciting opportunities, but then tries to solve those problems collectively and makes them happen, I think that for me is the most exciting. Great stuff, thank you. I, I'm sure it's no coincidence that you know Manchester both has uh, one of the highest growth rates of any city in the UK over the last period that it has got a dense network of, of, of regeneration and other organisations, that they, you, collectively fund one of the biggest private sector delegations there is uh, at Mipman, certainly one of the biggest from the UK, uh, because that is exactly the point that Pat was making earlier. It's that when people leave, they're leaving to other firms and the, the, the knowledge engine that is how you do regeneration uh, continues. So, so thank you very much uh, for, for coming and, and listening and participating, and if you're a sponsor, for sponsoring. Um, uh, I've, I've taken a lot from this. I, I came into this thinking that um, levelling up is not a zero-sum game, and I leave it, but hopefully leave it with a few more tips 
on, on, on how we can do it. Um, I think the next stand session is, an, is tomorrow morning, isn't it? Uh, I think there'll be a, a slightly larger audience uh, for that one, because I'm back interviewing Gary Neville, but they won't be any more attentive than you, I'm sure. So thank you very much for being so attentive, and can you thank Eamon, uh, Pat and Tim in the usual way. Thank you. Until the night is over I wanna hold you so tight So tight, coming closer It's been a hell of a ride But every